We're now going to pivot back towards measures of money away from uh, the issues of monetary policy, because I think you guys have a good understanding of what the, the Fed is trying to do in terms of targeting interest rates. And now what we want to do is explore some of these assets that maybe we don't think of as money and how they can behave in a money-like way. So if you're working for Amarillo National Bank, if you're working for Bank of America or Goldman Sachs, you need to be aware of how some of these assets behave in a monetary fashion. And a really good starting point for that lately has been cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, because it brings up a lot of questions regarding how a money rule is designed, what affects a very fixed monetary policy, and Bitcoin is a very fixed monetary policy, may have on the volatility of a currency. And then we'll move on from crypto into real estate, energy prices, art markets, and finally credit card debt is giving you an idea of how the Federal Reserve can influence many different markets that you will be dealing with as a potential banker. So what I want you guys to remember, of course, is always put money into kind of these two parables of problems, being the problem of inflation. Uh, if you've read the Dionysius of Syracuse paper, for example, that should be posted on Blackboard earlier on. I'll post another copy up or the DC Babysitter Co-op, which is deflation, not Dionysius. What he did in order to pay off his debts was he printed up a bunch of new coins with his face on them. Okay, here we are. Uh, I have doubled the money supply, and he was able to pay off his debts, but of course that led to an inflation tax, an inflation cost imposed on the people of Syracuse. The DC Babysitter Co-op is a story in the 1970s regarding a group of young policymakers moving to Washington, DC, uh, they need babysitting. They decide to create kind of their own script to kind of pay each other back for every hour of babysitting they do for each other. And the problem being is that everybody wants to babysit, or sorry, excuse me, nobody wants to babysit on Friday and Saturday because that's when people want to go out. Uh, and then everybody wants to babysit on Monday and Tuesday because that's when people want to stay in. So that leads to hoarding of this script in terms of Friday and Saturday, and then a glut of the script in Monday and Tuesday when it's not needed. So in this case, we have this deflationary problem. We'll see both of these issues in Bitcoin, and we'll see it based on the money growth pool that it has. So remember your roles of money. Money is a durable service, provides a medium of exchange, store of account, store of value, unit of account, and speculative asset. Money is generally by fiat, by decree. It's supplied by the Federal Reserve and it's backed by its credibility with consumers and firms. Money is money because we believe it to be money. And this is going to be an important concept for cryptocurrency. So let's start talking about the foundation of how cryptocurrency is going to work uh, with this kind of idea of online payments. The first real push in technology that's needed for this to work and is a brilliant bit of technology on the part of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and those programmers who worked on this idea of a cryptocurrency is the blockchain. The blockchain is a decentralized history of transactions. This will slow counterfeit hacking. Uh, it gives an independent verification of those transactions. So if the Federal Reserve is a centralized ledger of all the transactions that happen between banks, Blockchain is going to be a decentralized, independent ledger. So the Bitcoin miners that maybe you hear about in the news, the people that provide computing power from their computers and can get paid off in uh, the lottery of getting Bitcoin at a certain time, what do they do? How are they mining this? Well, they're I made air quotes there, right? Sorry, guys. How do they do this? Well, what they're actually doing is providing computer power to verify any of the transactions that are going on within the Bitcoin economy. So if ever I purchase something with Bitcoin or sell something with Bitcoin, I need that verification to happen. And the miners play that role as verifiers and they are paid for that role through entering a lottery to earn a certain amount of Bitcoin. So this money supply, by the way, is tied to the number of transactions made, right? There's more Bitcoin being mined because transactions are going on. So as money demand is increasing, money supply should be increasing with it to stabilize that price. Satoshi Nakamoto designed this to be a stable medium of exchange. It didn't turn out that way, but that's what it was designed to be. And so the verification process depends not on time, there's no real seasonality in Bitcoin unless there's seasonality in Bitcoin purchases. 
Everything depends on the number of transactions being made and the speed of those transactions going on. So this again is assuming Bitcoin is purely a medium of exchange. Uh, there's a nice Fed out of, the, out of the Dallas Federal Reserve in their Financial Insights newsletter back in 2017 that describes in, in visualization how this works. You've got the Fed being a centralized ledger, a centralized system of transactions, whereas Bitcoin would be this decentralized system of transactions, right? So it's a good paper, by the way, if you want to look that up. So let's talk then about these money growth rules. Uh, the overall goal, of course, was stable prices, stable inflation to provide a medium of exchange. And the way that Satoshi Nakamoto and other uh, Bitcoin users have described this is it's Friedman's K percent growth rule, which should theoretically be one of the most stable money growth rules you have as assuming velocity is zero, which it's not, but okay. Assuming stable money demand, then what we have is inflation being influenced by money supply. So this is that Friedman quote of inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. So we're not using a Taylor rule approach where we look at inflation and output within the economy, and then we raise or lower interest rates based off of that using money supply. Uh, we don't have a demand side from this or a supply side from well, necessarily. Yeah, we don't have a demand side necessarily. We have a supply side from this. Um, what we have then is Bitcoin is supposed to grow at a stable rate. Now, if it followed Friedman's rule, then that would mean, okay, it grows by 2% every era, no matter what. But that's not what Bitcoin actually does. It's not a Friedman money growth rule. Okay, so anyone that blogs or writes articles about this saying that Bitcoin is based on a Friedman money growth rule, they're actually wrong. It's not. It's based off of an approximation of the gold standard. It's based off of actually a misinterpretation of the Friedman money growth rule. Because what Bitcoin does is it places a limit of 21 million in total supply. So this is the algorithm's equation. It's quite nice that 210,000 uh, when we add on some of the zeros from what's being done down here, right, it's going to be 21 million. 21 million is the hard limit. So Bitcoin is going to grow up to that 21 million and then stop growing. That's not a Friedman K percent growth rule. That's a gold standard. That is a, we are mining into this, right, there's that mining term, right? We are mining into a, a certain amount and our mining efforts will speed up or slow down based off of what's going on with the transactions. So this is not a Friedman rule. There are also, by the way, in this case, in the calculation of it, notice we have no interest rates. There's no output gap. There's no explicit inflation target. This is not a Taylor rule either. All right, everything is based off of the number of transactions and the era, this I era that Bitcoin is within. Well, what is an era? So miners, when they provide this supply, get paid off in Bitcoin. In an era zero, they earned, uh, let me go ahead and find the number. There we go. Uh, they earned 50 Bitcoin for mining it, which 50 Bitcoin today, you're like, oh my gosh, 50 times 60,000, right? Because $60,000 ish right now. Um, I'll have to check this morning. I haven't, I haven't checked it this morning. Um, 50 times 60,000, that's a lot of money. But back in era one, Bitcoin was actually maybe worth 10 cents, 50 cents. Maybe it was a dollar. Uh, so that was, okay, you get 50 bucks for it. Now, of course, the price increased. There's more incentive to mine then, right? So you get more miners jumping in to verify these transactions. But once we get to a certain number of transactions, which is measured by what's called a block hype, once we get to a certain block height, this cluster of transactions, then we will get to a halving period. So the reward will be cut in half for those miners. So it went down from 50 down to 25, from 25 down to 12.5. And currently we are coming up on the next halving of, of this era. We're in era one, two, three, four. And we're not quite sure when this is going to happen because that depends on the number of transactions being made. So more transactions, we get there faster. Fewer transactions, time slows down. This is why I'm saying time is important for this. Uh, because if we have a lot of transactions and we have a high reward, we're going to get a whole lot of miners jumping in for this. 
and then we're going to get more verifications of transactions. That velocity is going to speed up, right? Velocity is not zero, right? So that's money supply is actually going to speed up in terms of what they are producing. Theoretically, the idea is supposed to be uh, that, let me go ahead and start from the current slide here. What is supposed to be is we start off at this point here with the dollar to Bitcoin price. And as we get more transactions, right, as that money demand increases, that money supply increases proportionally with it. And that creates stable money demand. So Bitcoin being adopted slowly will lead to a stable fluctuation in these exchange rates, which, as you know, didn't happen. What actually happened with Bitcoin? Well, money demand was much more volatile and the money supply production could not keep up with it. So here we have this huge increase in money demand, but less money supply. Okay, how is this working, right? Imagine this. If I take Bitcoin, and this, this is me using Bitcoin to buy pizza and soda and rent a movie every Friday night uh, with my kids, and I expect it to stay at that same price, so I'll go ahead and spend it. I'm not gonna hoard it. I'm not gonna do this DC babysitter co-op deflationary business, no. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to spend it because I know I'm not gonna get more return from holding on to it. I'm not gonna speculate with it, right? But if I believe that price is going to go up, I'm going to hoard that Bitcoin. In fact, I'm going to buy a lot of it, right? And hold on to it, but then I'm not selling a lot of it either. I'm not using a lot of it for those transactions as well. So that money demand is actually going up uh, quite a bit, but then the money supply based on lack of transactions. Right? I have a lot of demand for Bitcoin at a very high price because I think it's going to go up in price. But I'm not going to make those transactions with the Bitcoin I am hoarding. So that is not going to translate into the mining of the money supply and the verification. So we have an unstable money demand. We have massive speculation. So Bitcoin, while designed to be a medium of exchange, became a speculative asset through how we use it and not uh, to, to rip off a of Friedman in accordance with the purpose of those who founded it. Interesting how that works, right? So how would Bitcoin die if it ever were to die? Well, this is what the death of a money would look like, is you have very, very high, say, money demand and high money supply, and then money demand crashes such that if we extend this line, we can see a negative price, right? Which, if it's negative, hey, people aren't going to hold on to it. They're going to sell it off, right? Zero is better than nothing, or they'll just, you know, get rid of it somehow. So what I want to do is give you guys an idea of what Bitcoin inflation looks like. But you know what? Let's do that with the next video. I think we've done a good job so far in this one of talking about the theory behind Bitcoin. I'm going to post this and then we will move on to the next video once I find my stop button.